<clears throat> so when I was a kid, um, there was a singer who was just starting out her musical career named Alanis Morissette. Some of you may know who Alanis Morissette is. Some of you won't. Um, anyways, she had a bunch of songs. Can't really recommend her as a great, uplifting singer. But there was one song that I remember in particular called Ironic. And I liked it because it had funny little ironies of things that happened in life. Uh, whether they're the exact example that you've experienced that she said or something else. Things like a traffic jam when you're already late, a free ride when you've already paid, 10,000 spoons when all you need is a knife, and good advice that you just didn't take. Um, in a somewhat similar vein, I've noticed pretty often that when I'm nervous or worried about something happening, there seemed to be a much larger chance of that thing happening. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed that, but it's, it's kind of like when you're wearing a white shirt. It's amazing how clean I can keep my black shirts. Like, they're pristine. No one, and no one cares. But as soon as you put on white, you're going to have spaghetti, or you're going to visit with somebody, or someone's gets, it just gets dirty. Uh, there's other things, like when I'm, I'm oftentimes I'm, I'm walking around the church, and I'll carry a, a glass of water, and I can carry that glass of water, like, I can carry it perfectly. And it was, and it's awesome, I don't spill a drop, but when I carry a cup of coffee, slosh, everywhere. Just can't, can't control the this, this silly thing. I can drive through the wilderness, this is a real story, I can drive through the wilderness of Montana at three in the morning, till seven in the morning, with my eyes peeled for deer, and not see a single one. And then on my way home from, the, like, from somewhere, like, say, Canistano, on a particular Tuesday morning at 10 a.m., I have to swerve violently out of the way for a giant moose. Like, I do not understand why things happen the way that they do. It's kind of ironic that when we're so worried about something that it tends to happen more, and when we don't really care, it just goes fine. It's upside down. It doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. And since you're in church, you know that I'm going to connect this to Jesus. And it's not a hard connection to make because Jesus often said things that at the time didn't make a lot of sense. And people were kind of left scratching their head and wondering, what does he mean? What's all that about? Today, we're going to look at a statement that Jesus made that had a certain kind of mystery or irony to it that we really need to understand. And it's in the book of John chapter 12. All right, so please turn in your Bibles to John 12. John chapter 12, verse 20. John 12, we're going to just walk through this passage slowly. We'll start reading in verse 20 and study as we go. So here's verse 20 and to 22. Some Greeks who had come to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration paid a visit to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. They said, sir, we want to meet Jesus. Philip told Andrew about it, and they went together to ask Jesus. Uh, John always does a good job of setting up the passage for us, and this is what he's doing here right now. And it doesn't seem to have a really big bearing on where the, the text goes. It's almost like Philip and Andrew meet these Greeks, and they say, hey, we want to meet Jesus. And they talk, and they're like, perfect, let's go. And they usher them in to a sermon that Jesus is already giving, and we're kind of stepping into it mid-narrative. And here's what Jesus says in, verses, in verse 23. Jesus replied, now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone, but its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. So it's when I read little paragraphs like this that I'm really glad that the Holy Spirit caused Jesus' words to be written down. Because there's so much wrapped up in this passage. So many things that if we weren't paying attention completely back in the day, we'd just totally miss it. But today we have the luxury of going through what Jesus said slowly and carefully. And so here's, what he, here's how it goes. Jesus said that the time of his glory is fast approaching. This is his last week on earth. All right, actually the whole last third of the book of John is focused on what we sometimes call Holy Week. All right, so the last seven days of Jesus' life. John has taken the first two-thirds of his book, and he's told you about three years of Jesus' life. The last part of John is seven days 
of Jesus' life. He really slows down. And so it's, it's really important that we know how important this last week of Jesus' life is. At the end of these seven days, Jesus is going to die on the cross. He's going to die for you. He's going to die for me on the cross. At the end of these seven days, Jesus is going into the ground like a piece of wheat at seeding time. And the return is massive. Farmers plant one wheat seed, and they get, depending on who you talk to, they get about 45 seeds in return. Tim and I had a negotiation. He, I said 30, he said 60, so we settled at 45. Uh, so 45 seeds. For one wheat seed, you get a 45 seed return. That is incredible return. And Jesus died for our sin. And in return, he raised, he returned a crop that could be millions, maybe even billions of people who have repented of their sin and believed and received the good news and the free gift of eternal life. Jesus started that by giving his life up. That's what happens when the seed that dies is the son of God. The return is far bigger than we could ever imagine. So that's what Jesus is alluding to. We understand that pretty well. But then let's read the next verse, because this, I think, is the most important verse in the passage. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. I'm sure the audience asked the question that we have to ask as well, which is, what does that mean? Like, what is Jesus talking about that those who love their lives will lose it, but those who care nothing will keep it for eternity? What does Jesus mean by this? It almost sounds irresponsible, nonsensical. So here's, here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a stab at this. All of us here, every single person in this room, love their lives. I believe that's true. We like being alive. Even though life can be hard at times, we like being alive, and we have a deep-seated instinct to stay alive. But it goes a little deeper than that. That's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is talking about a, a chunk of people who not just love being alive, but they worship their lives. I don't know if I've ever thought about this in this context. So they, they worship their lives. And what I mean by that is that they invest all of their time and all of their money in making their lives better. They take the money that they have and they spend it on themselves. They do all that they can to preserve their health. They put a ton of energy into being accepted by others, into seeing the world, into cars and toys. Sometimes those people will do all of those things, and sometimes they'll only do a few. But the overall pattern is that the people who worship their lives are far more invested in themselves than in anything else. Their time and money are spent primarily on things that have to do with them. They love their lives and their priorities show it. But no matter how much work they can do, no matter how much investment they pour into their lives, no matter how many toys and how many homes and how many trips, what happens to their life? They lose it. Isn't that ironic? You think about it, you put so much care and attention into something. And even and, and at the end of it all, do you get to keep it? No. You lose it. It's like losing a briefcase that was handcuffed to your wrists. You cared about that thing so much. You did so much to keep it. You cared for it. You polished it. You told everybody about how great it was. And then when you get to the end, it's gone. That's a terrible feeling. That you would love and care for something so much, and yet you would just lose it. Even though you loved it, even though you worshipped it, you lost it. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying about those who love, who worship their lives. That ironically, even though they pour everything into it, they lose it. But then he contrasts it with this other side and says that those who care nothing for their lives will keep them for all eternity. And that's also a statement that has kind of an upside down feeling with a lot of meaning in it that those who do not love their lives but instead risk them, invest them, spend them on something not themselves, obviously in following Jesus, will receive them back and not just receive them back but receive them with an eternal upgrade attached. Following Jesus 
is a life that is full of risk, high risk. Jesus promises that we will have trouble. He doesn't promise health and wealth. He promises trouble, but you don't have to be afraid. That's not quite a great sales pitch, is it? That you're going to have trouble. There's going to be hard things, but don't be afraid. I've got it under control. A lot of us know the truth of that in our minds, but it takes a long time to get down to our hearts. Hebrews 11 talks about horrible things that happened to Christians back in the day and forecasts that horrible things can and will and, and often happen to people right now in this day and age. We know of Christians being killed for what they believe all over the world ever since Jesus walked the earth. We know of persecution of Christians that's happening even now. We saw a family on the screen who went through horrible persecution for the name of Jesus. And some of you may have experienced hard times yourself in your own life because of Jesus and what, he, and what you believe. But I'm going to say this, guys. Who cares? We have the answer. We got it. If you believe in Jesus, you have the solution to eternal life. You have the salvation of your sins. You are no longer doomed to hell, but saved for heaven. Jesus is the key to life evermore. And the paltry 80 years of hardship and danger that you're going to go through are nothing compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, your Lord. That love for Jesus has, <clears throat> excuse me, that we're hopefully cultivating and growing in us makes everything seem like it doesn't matter at all. And I'm not saying that stuff in this life doesn't matter. There are many verses in the Bible that tell us to work hard, that tell us to care, that tell us to invest in this life because we have a mission from God, but it's not worshiping our lives. What we love, what we worship, what we spend our time and money on, what our priorities are, that's Jesus. There's no other priority. You should care nothing for anything else in this life other than Jesus when compared, to the, when compared to the love and care that you have for Christ, everything else, nothing else matters. You should care nothing about your own life compared to Christ. If your friends don't like Jesus, should that stop you from talking about him? If your spouse doesn't like or believe in Jesus, should you just give up? If your money, sorry, if your job says you can't talk about Jesus, is that going to stop you? If Jesus costs you time and money and energy and risk, is that worth it? I think we need to answer that question very sincerely in our hearts. Because you know that I'm asking it rhetorically. But I think a lot of us struggle when it comes down to the rubber meeting the road. Is Jesus worth the risk? Is Jesus worth the time? Is Jesus worth the money? Is Jesus worth the trouble? And obviously the answer is yes, but you have to answer that. I can't just say it for you. That is a conviction that you must hold because Jesus said, I have not come to bring peace to this world, but a sword. I have not come to unite families. I've come to divide them because you're going to need to choose Jesus. And that choice needs to supersede every single other choice in your life, even family. If you're, going, if you're following Jesus and your family says, I'm not, then you follow Jesus and you leave your family behind. That is the depth of love and commitment that Jesus wants from you. That is what being a disciple of Jesus means. And when you do that, when you take that life that you care so much for and that you love being a part of, when you take that and say, I count this as nothing, I place it at the feet of Jesus, he not only gives you it back, but he polishes it. And he gives it back to you sparkling, new, and eternal. All you have to do is give everything up. And when you give everything up, when you give your life to Jesus, you become something different. You become a servant of Jesus. So keep, go back into your scriptures. Take a look at verse 26. Anyone who wants to serve me must follow me. Because my servants must be where I am. And the Father will honor anyone who serves me. So if you're a servant of Jesus, you need to be where he is. For the disciples, that was easy. He was physically right there. We could say, okay, I can do that. I can follow Jesus. For the next six days, at least, they were there. But for us, it's a little bit different because Jesus is not physically present. So it means something a little bit different. 
<clears throat> it means that we need to be obedient. It means that we need to go where he tells us to go and be who he wants us to be and do what he tells us to do. Why? Because we're his servants. Jesus doesn't serve us. We serve Jesus. I think sometimes we forget that that's the order of things. We are Jesus' servants because he is the king. And a king is to be obeyed. If Jesus says jump, we say how high, right? If Jesus says go, we go. If Jesus says stay, we stay. But we always follow him wherever he leads. If he leads us into risk, we go. If he tells us to stay because it's working right now, we stay. We're his servants. For me, this is a hard thing because it has always meant that I have to one day leave, that I need, that I go to a church and I love its people and I serve them as much as I can. And then one day Jesus may say, Phil, it's time to go. I'm not saying that right now, but this is something that if, if you wonder what a pastor has to go through or what a pastor has to deal with, this is one of the, the crosses that pastors are called to bear that they have to leave one day. And it costs us time and money and friends and comfort. And serving Jesus is not easy. It hurts. But I'm a servant. I'm not the master. You're a servant. You're not the master. I think at times we get it mixed up. We think of Jesus as a genie who grants our wishes and helps us when things are hard, rather than the God of the universe who we have promised to love, cherish, and obey as a wife promises her husband. Because we are the bride of Christ. And we submit to Jesus. This can be hard. And it puts us into places where we can feel at risk or nervous or scared or upset about what Jesus is asking us to do. And I'm sure some of you have felt those emotions when it comes to what you believe and what you think Jesus is telling you to do. Jesus also felt that way. You're not alone in that. He was a human just like you. He knows how you feel because he felt like that. Look at verse 27. Now my soul is deeply troubled. This is Jesus speaking. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But this is the very reason I came. Father, bring glory to your name. Then a voice spoke from heaven saying, I have already brought glory to my name and I will do so again. When the crowd heard the voice, some thought it was thunder while others declared an angel had spoken to him. Then Jesus told them, the voice was for your benefit, not mine. The time for judging this world has come, when Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to, my, to myself. He said this to indicate how he was going to die. So as I've said, Jesus is about to go into the earth seven days from when he says this. And he is going to be lifted up and everyone is going to see him. That's his death on the cross. And he does not feel excited about this. And that's okay. He feels troubled. He feels distressed. And that distress is multifaceted distress. He is deeply troubled about the pain and the suffering that are coming. He is also deeply troubled that some people are going to hear the message of the gospel and they're going to reject it or they're not going to listen or they're going to think, well, that's kind of superstitious and I don't really believe that. Jesus is troubled by the pain and the suffering that's coming. He knows that's why he came but it doesn't stop him from feeling the normal emotions that a human would feel about an impending death. And so he pours that out to God right there and asks God to glorify his name. And amazingly, a voice comes down from heaven and says, I have glorified it. Unbelievable. I don't get an audible voice very often. I think I've got it maybe twice in my life. And everyone heard this. And I wish we had more time to dissect this. But what I will say is this, is that when you're feeling stressed, when you're feeling anxious about what God is calling you to do, you need to pray and you need to involve others in that prayer because you never know what's going to happen. God literally spoke down and Jesus heard that voice, but it wasn't for him. It was to encourage everybody else. Imagine what can happen with the power of a testimony or what God has done in your life. It's so good you guys shared what you shared because we are all encouraged by that. And the fact that you apologize so many times for crying, and I so thank you for doing that, but never don't cry in this pulpit. It's been baptized by the tears of believers from so many of you here. And that is so valuable. Because we all need to know what God is doing. 
We all need to have an answer to prayer. We all need to see those tears and feel that stress because God encourages us through that. We get vulnerable and God answers. Jesus gets vulnerable with these people. He says, my heart is deeply troubled. I'm concerned about what's coming up. And God literally speaks down from heaven. The body of Christ sharing together can encourage one another, can help one another, can walk through these things and see answers to prayer. We need to celebrate the wins of answers to prayer together. Let's be like Jesus and cry out for help with others and just see how God answers you. <clears throat> we have no idea what he's going to do. I don't think that anyone expected God to answer Jesus in that moment. But he did. And people speculated about what it meant. And some of them heard and some of them didn't. And it did, I'm sure it was encouraging for many people. Now finally, Jesus says one last thing. Take a look into your scriptures here. Jesus replied, Oh, sorry, the crowd responded, but we're not going to read that. Verse 35, Jesus replied, My light will shine for you just a little longer. Walk in the light while you can, so the darkness will not overtake you. Those who walk in the darkness cannot see where they're going. Put your trust in the light while there's still time. Then you will become children of light. <clears throat> so he says that his light is going to be with them just a little longer. So the disciples need to walk in the light. What does that mean for us now? Back then, we know it means that in seven days, Jesus is going to die and be taken back to his father. But for us here and now, I thought about it as sticking a stick into a fire. I don't know how many of you were allowed to do that as a kid. I wasn't, so I did it all the time. Um, but you, you know, you, 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 there's a campfire going on. You've got a stick and you just hold it in there. You pull it out and it's got that ember on it and you wave it around and make cool designs and it smokes all over the place and you're just enamored with this little ember on the end of a stick and you're showing everybody around the campfire how cool you are. And I just think that is the enthusiasm and excitement that we need to have as believers. We are to be childlike in our faith. This is a childlike thing to stick a stick in a fire and wave it all over the place and everybody sees what's going on. Yes, that is how we live our Christian life. We need to stick ourselves in the light of the world, light ourselves up, and let the world see what's going on. Because we have so much to be thankful for, so much to be excited about. And Jesus says, walk in this light. And not only will you know where you're going, but other people around you will know where to go because you, you shine that light of the world, not just in your heart, but to everybody who is around you. You can have confidence in following Jesus. And I... I feel so inspired, like I was telling you before. I got to sit at these AGC meetings with men who had that stick in the fire. They were confident, bold men who love Jesus and don't waste their time on anything else. I want to be like that. I want to have the confidence to follow Jesus into anything, not caring about my life at all, just following him. I want to be like Keith, who led our service. He went into Niger. He went to Senegal because he's following Jesus. I want to know more about Jesus. I want to know Jesus so deeply that he changes me from who I am now into the wise, godly man that he wants me to be. And every single one of you here in this room, he has that desire for you to become a godly, saved person. That's why he went to the cross. So that you could be literally everything you were created to be. And he says... The time is short. Put your trust in the light while there's still time. You don't know when you're going to die. You don't know. You have no idea. Jesus knew. He knew he had seven days left. You don't know. You don't know if you're going to be called home today or tomorrow or next week or in 70 years. You just don't know. And so I want to ask you, what are you doing with the time that God has given to you? Are you spending it carefully? Are you worrying after the details of your life? Are you padding your life with comforts? Or are you caring nothing for your life? Because really, who cares about anything in this life without Jesus? Are you spending it in pursuit of Jesus? You're going to get hurt. You might get abandoned. You might get mocked. You probably will get mocked. But who cares? We spend so much time of our lives trying to stay safe or have friends or look cool or make money. And the irony of all of this is that Jesus says, none of that matters. 
Those who love their life in this world will lose it. You will lose health and safety and money and friends. And in comparison with Jesus, none of that matters. The only person, the only relationship that matters is your relationship with Jesus. And that will cost you everything. It will cost you friends when they disagree with you about Jesus and how to live life. He will cost you money, giving it away to people to love them or to support churches or to send people to Costa Rica or feeding the hungry. Jesus will cost you safety because he may call you to a dangerous place or he may call you to work with sick people or he may call you to work with dangerous people. He will cost you your life because that's what it takes to follow him. Whoever wants to be his disciples needs to deny themselves, take up their cross and follow him. And when I say take up their cross, I mean deny yourself money and friends and safety and health and your very self because the only thing that matters is to pick up your cross and follow him. Do that while there's still time. Today feels like everything's fine, but you don't know what's going to happen after church. You don't know what's going to happen when you go home. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. While there's still time, choose Jesus. Repent of your sin and receive that gift of eternal life. Let me pray for you. Lord God, thank you again for this time that you have given to us to worship you. Thank you for the testimonies that we've heard from Farouk and from Solomon and their families, from Tim and Melissa, from Keith. Lord, thank you for the prayer that we could have. Thank you for our Costa Rica team. Thank you most of all, Lord, for the gift of eternal life that you have given to us. Father, I know there are people in this room who choose to pass on what you have to offer. Lord, please impact their hearts today. Please show them that, the, that you are the only way to heaven, that you are the only hope that we have in this life, and that every, it may it cost us everything, Lord. It is worth it because we will not lose everything but gain it. In Jesus' name, amen.